Jason, you fucking dick. I'm s I, I'm so disappointed in the job I did and the person you turned out to be. Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Plays. My name is Simon and welcome back. What we have here is an episode sponsored by the fine people over at Squarespace. What, what? Yes, go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. What is Squarespace? It's a great place to build a website. I don't know why I'm going into the ad read, that comes later. Let's just get into it. What happens here? Danny writes me a script. I will read said script, scrap, and we'll sprinkle in some fine vintage means. I go to print this out this morning. There's 10 pages lying on like, Danny, for God's sake. And I'm like, the last page better just be, it better just be like that just the top line has spilled onto the other page. No, it's a solid half a page there. Brilliant. My poor legs are so tired, Danny. And you make me stand here forever. The only verdict is vengeance. A vendetta. Uh, this one is all about amazing times people got called out for fake flexes. I don't know, sometimes Danny's like, Simon, why is a fake flex? And I'm like, okay, boomer. I, I just saw it all over YouTube and all over like the internet where it's like, you know, people are like, check out my brand new Rolex, baby. And then people who know about watches like that is clearly a fake. Or, you know, it's like the Instagram celeb influencer celebrity generation where it's like, yeah, you just go to the airport and stand in front of a private jet and have your picture. I'm like, this is some weird ass shit that's going on. Why is everyone pretending to be rich? It just makes you look like a dick. Let's get on with it. But Danny didn't know what a flake fake. <laughs> but Danny didn't know what a flake. I can't even say fake flex, but Danny didn't know what it was. And I was like, Danny, it's the people who fake being rich, but I don't know because they think it makes themselves look cool. But Danny somehow managed to squeeze 10 pages out of something he didn't know what it was previously. Brilliant, thanks Danny, let's go. <laughs> I think it was during double period maths when my friend Richard Petman turned around to me and casually remarked that he was feeling a bit sleepy because he'd been up all night playing on his brand new Commodore. Amiga. For those of us who were lucky enough to own a computer or console would still be making do with 8-bit machines for some time yet, and it was an earth-shattering revelation that Richard's affluent parents had taken their lucky son into the thrilling new dimension of 16-bit. I have no idea what any of this means. I thought, like, am I on a 64-bit computer? I feel like at some point computers became 64-bit. But then have we only really times four times since Danny was a kid? That doesn't seem right. I'm gonna stop talking because I don't know what I'm talking about. My suspicions were aroused a little later when I asked him about what games he'd been playing and he came up with some generic sounding titles that I'd never heard of, such as 3D Death Doom Alien Blaster. Although honestly, I mean, it sounds a bit generic, but it does sound like an actual video game. But I was still excited to ask if I could call round to his house after school to have a play on the new Amiga, and by the time got word got round the classroom, about six other kids had invited themselves along too. I get the feeling because of the topic of this video, he's not gonna have one of these. And it's like, how far do you think this goes? Like, what's gonna happen? I know kids, they just don't think, like, their ability to see the future is like, they're, they're like blind to it. But it's like, dude, what do you think is gonna happen? Like, people are gonna come round and be like, okay, so where's this Amiga thing? And he's gonna be like, oh no, I don't have one of those. <laughs> what do you think was gonna happen? Spoiler alert, Richard Petman's parents hadn't brought him an, bought him an Amiga. They just, he'd just made the whole thing up to give the impression that he was always first in line to play on these new expensive toys that nobody else could afford. Richard was always a bit like that. And it was weird because he didn't really have to do this. Everyone knew that his family was minted. Oh wait, so his family were rich. <gasps> okay, well like, yeah, that is a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> It was even weirder that he agreed to let all of us come round to his house that night anyway and continue to hype up the fabulous new machine for the rest of the day. He clearly wasn't thinking all of this through. No, he wasn't. Or maybe he was. Shortly after we arrived at his house for our very first go on 3D Death Doom Alien Blaster, Richard dropped the bombshell that had grown bored of the Amiga already and so just swapped it out for a tatty old handheld Pac-Man game which I knew for a fact that it had for years. The response from the rest of the kids wasn't very positive. They called him a time-wasting wanker <laughs> and disappeared down the street to set fire to a telephone box or something. Oh, Danny. I actually felt a bit of sympathy for Richard and just ended up playing Pac-Man with him all night. Even years later, he never admitted that he, <laughs> that he lied. So you dug yourself a hole. It's like, no, 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 I always had one of those Amigas. Richard, you're a 45-year-old man. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Be like, I had it, you son of a bitch. Oh my God. Stop fucking lying. Thinking about it now, I'm only just beginning to have serious doubts about the story Richard told about getting a Sherman tank for Christmas and driving it through Rotherham Town Centre. <laughs> I fucking love kids. The sh come up with. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a tank for Christmas. And the immediate response, you know, among adult group would be like, 
What are you talking about? <laughs> Where among kids, it's really wow! And this is perhaps a very early and very British and not particularly useful or relevant example of fake flexing. I'm something of a leading expert on the concept of fake flexing. Oh, are you, Danny? Because in the email you sent to me, you said you didn't know what it was. Sounds like you're fake flexing right now. Well, I say that. I didn't immediately understand what this topic was even meant to be about. My, oh, Danny's doing a fake flex right now. This is like flexception. <laughs> My search results on Google kept leading me to articles about fake flexible working hours during the pandemic. That sounds incredibly boring. Uh, which I felt sounded quite businessy, so I knew I was on the wrong track with that one. <laughs> Welcome to business, Blaze. But it's apparently quite common for influencers and rappers to flex their wealth on social media by showing off photographs of their wildly expensive cars, bling, private jets, designer sneakers, or even just piles of cold hard cash. Yeah, wasn't this some dude? I feel it was some, I feel it was a rapper of some variety. He was like in the middle of a divorce or something, or maybe it was bankruptcy. <laughs> and he just took a picture on a bed with just piles, just stacks of cash. And people were like, bro, you, you don't think they're gonna like, whoever the lawyer is on the other side is gonna be like, uh, we saw that picture on your Instagram with you sitting in a bathtub full of money. What's up? <laughs> And I think then he was like, no, no, it was fake money. So that was a fucking lie. And I don't know, did we, maybe Danny will have this one on there. I hope so, because I want to know if that was real and if so, what happened? And I mean, like, come on. But it's equally common for these rappers and influencers, and to be honest, it's mostly rappers, to get caught out with fake flexing in which the pictures perhaps don't tell the whole story. It does make you wonder why they even bother, as I can't see how flexing wealth achieves anything other than making you look like a bit of a knob. A rich knob, maybe, but a rich knob is still a knob. I also feel maybe there's a bit of a cultural difference here between the US and the UK. I don't mean in a, neg in a negative way, or I, I just mean in a neutral observation way. But in the US, it's more okay to flex your wealth, whereas in the UK, uh, I think people are a bit more subtle about it. If anything, it appears to drive away respect and potential friendship. A recent study published by the Journal of Social Psychology and Personality Science revealed the intriguing truth behind the status signals paradox. Apparently, 66% of us would choose a luxury car over a more basic model. But when we're given the choice of making friends with somebody who drives a flashy car or somebody who drives a cheaper model, a significant majority of us would be more attracted to the guy driving the rusty old bucket. I think that's because in our mind, we associate rich people with being dicks and I don't know why this is because all I, I don't know I know a few rich people and it's like they're really nice like I don't I, I mean I imagine there are dickheads who are rich I, maybe there's more I don't know I don't know it's never been like I, I've known poor people I've known rich people I don't know it's like normal there's people who are dicks and there are people who are nice <laughs> So we like the idea of showing off our own wealth with a super swish vehicle, but if other people do exactly the same thing, then we eat, take an instant dislike to those vulgar swines. And maybe this goes some way to explaining why we derive such perverse pleasure from a fake flexor getting caught with his cheap imitation pants down in full, humiliating view of the world. Loser cruisers. It's all very well proudly sharing a photo on Instagram which shows yourself posing at the wheel of your new Ferrari. But the post may turn a bit uh, but the post may turn into a bit of a social media car crash if it's later exposed that you actually just rented it and then had to reluctantly hand the keys back over to the dealer. Over the years, big names such as Justin Bieber, 50 Cent, and Lil Kim have been caught out apparently claiming ownership of some of the most expensive cars in the world, only to be revealed that the wheels didn't actually belong to them at all. <laughs> but Justin Bieber, 50 Cent, Lil Kim, I have no idea who Lil Kim is. I do know Justin Bieber a 50 cents are. Justin, I know they can afford those expensive cars. Why don't you just buy them? <laughs> You're mad rich. One of the most famous examples occurred on a 2002 episode of MTV Cribs, a TV show which has a long and dubious track record of attracting fake flexors who are keen to invite the lucky viewers on a VIP guided tour of their fabulous home, even if the home in question was just rented for the weekend. Ah, uh, this is like, maybe this is the British person in me, but I'd be like, you could f right off like and you see like architectural dye dress and stuff going around these like influencers homes and sh i'd be like get the fuck out of my life <laughs> like i don't want you looking at my house it's weird Go away. Birdman wasn't one of those fakers. The American rapper and co-founder of Cash Money Rewards was happy to show off his genuine luxurious home on the show, but also made sure that his pride and joy was parked slap bang in front of his big boy pad. The pride and joy in question was a 1972 Chevrolet Phantom Donk, a beast of a vehicle which is kind of like a mashup of a 1972 Chevrolet Caprice with a Rolls Royce. What the hell is even that? So you took a Rolls Royce and just made it a bit shit. 
I mean, I've driven it. I don't know what a, che a 972 Chevrolet Caprice is, but I'm going to assume that Chevrolets have got better over the last 50 years, and they're still sh like, I, I rented a Chevrolet once, and I was like, this is a pile of crap, allegedly. The rapper was clearly very much in love with his Phantom Dog, but it turns out that the car was more of a flight of fancy for Birdman. The Phantom Dog actually belonged to a car enthusiast from Cincinnati. And this kind of thing must be really frustrating for those uber-rich celebrities who are the genuine owners of such high-end vehicles. I don't think it bothers them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I own these cars. Other people pretend to own these cars. I imagine these people take a deep satisfaction being like, I actually own these vehicles, and these fakers don't. It's like, that's, that feels good. Like, you quietly enjoy that feeling. How are they supposed to command exclusive respect for owning such expensive piece of kit when any old chance can simply post a picture of themselves posing in a car that they just borrowed for the weekends? Irish professional, mixed martial artist, and boxer Conor McGregor was many of the high-profile names you'd felt that he'd come up with a cunning solution. Be seen treating the vehicle like you do whatever you'd like with it because you own it, and you're not going to have to explain any damage to the car rental dealership. Okay, well, one, isn't Conor McGregor absolutely mad rich? Because I don't know, boxing or didn't he do some boxing with the other dude and he got paid like hundreds of millions because somehow like boxing pays insanely well. I've no idea why. It's like you win Wimbledon and it's what you get like a few million. You win some like boxing match. It's like hundreds. What is going on? And also, I mean, I mean, also you can trash a car from the car rental place. You're just gonna have to pay for it on the insurance. Like, I don't think they cover deliberate damage. So then why didn't you just buy it in the first place? I suppose there are plenty of ways in which you could achieve this. Give a good kick, smash a few windows, key the word twat all the way down the side. But Conor McGregor didn't want to inflict too much damage on his new Rolls Royce Wraith in 2017, so it's happy to just jump on the bonnet for a swaggering selfie. After all, you're not likely to treat a rental car with such disrespect. I don't know, I think people are dicks. And I think one of the I think one of the biggest like uh, indicators of dickishness is one, how you treat other people, uh, especially when no one's watching, and two, how you treat other people's property. And I think dicks tend to treat their own property better than other people's. And good people tend to treat the property equally or better for other people's stuff because you're like, I don't want this person to have to, like, you know, this. There was just one problem though. The Rolls Royce Wraith was actually just rented from a luxury car company in Solihull called Platinum Executive Travel. And when the owner of the biz business, Lord Aleem, was alerted to Con Conor McGregor's post on social media. He wasn't happy that his Rolls Royce had been treated with such disrespect. There was talk in the press of Lord Aleem considering legal action against the former Cage Warriors champion and winner of the Ultimate Fighting Championship title, but instead he just made his own feelings known via social media. Ad addressing Conor personally, he said, when you own one, you can stand on it. Until then, you lose your deposit for standing on mine. <laughs> It's also believed that Connor have been perma has been permanently banned from the car rental dealership. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Good. But Connor already boasts a pretty impressive uh, car collection, including a Lamborghini Aventador, Jesus Christ, a DeLorean DMC-12, surprisingly achievable. You can get a, a I think you get a DeLorean for uh, like 20 to 40K, maybe slightly more in Europe because there's less of them here. But uh, that's on my list of, of cars to get and a Vauxhall Astra. All right then. <laughs> And considering that it had only recently been paid around $85 million after losing a flight to Floyd May Mayweather, good lord, that is what I was talking about, he might as well have just bought the Rolls Royce Wraith and then smashed it a bit with a hammer to prove that it belonged to him. You won $85 million, dude. I mean, a Rolls Royce Wraith is an expensive vehicle, but not that expensive. <laughs> Money talks. It's one thing to mess around posing with cars and jewelry and stuff, but some people might view this well flexing. It's just a tad too subtle. No one, no one, no one views that as too subtle. Some guy getting out of a bright yellow car like Lamborghini with like chains and a giant ass watch it's like no one's like wow that's subtle why not just cut straight to the crap and share pictures of your piles and piles of cash that should get the point across a bit quicker rapper 50 cent was never shy when it came to sharing his money or at least photographs of his money quite different things there and he certainly had plenty of cash to splash around in his heyday when people still bought his records at one point he was even the he was one of the richest stars in the entire hip-hop industry second only to the mighty billionaire jay-z it is wild that jay-z is a billionaire i mean there's not very many entertainers who are billionaires very impressive jay-z some of the photographs he shared on instagram in 2016 were possibly meant to be purposeful provocative. One of them showed the rapper sucking a lollipop as he sprawled out on a bed covered in money, while another snap revealed that he kept quite a few piles of cash in the fridge stacked up next to his low-fat cheese squares. The timing of some of these pictures was a little odd, though. 50 Cent had declared bankruptcy. Okay, so it's 50 Cent declaring bankruptcy with mounting debts of $22 million. Dude. Dude. How do you get $22 million into debt? That is 
Mwah. And the subsequent photographs had caught the attention of the very judge that had dealt with the filing. 50 Cent had fallen from grace and paper by this point following a slump in his career, failed legal battles and poor investment decisions. It's probably those poor investment decisions. $22 million. I'm rich. Oh. Most significantly, he had been ordered by his ex to pay his ex-girlfriend, Lestonia Leviston, a total of $7 million for invasion of privacy after uploading a private sex tape to his website without her consent. That was a very expensive click, my dude. Not as expensive as Elon Musk's tweet, but still. Also, you douchebag. Uh, disturbingly, he alleged... No, 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 no. Look. That was a court thing, he was ordered to pay it. I think we can officially say that uploading a sex tape with your ex-girlfriends, 50 Cent, is a douche bag move. You colossal douche. How dare you! Disturbingly, he had bought the tape from his from her later boyfriend, years after the end of their own, wait, what? After their own relationship, and added his own brand of scornful commentary to the video. What are you up to? What is going on? What is your life? But it seems unlikely that Lestonia would ever be able to collect the even 50 cents from the rapper after filing for bankruptcy. 50 Cent was hauled back from the bankruptcy court when Judge Anne Nevins expressed concerns over his Instagram photographs, which she felt raised question marks over his alleged need for bankruptcy and were, at a minimum, openly minimum openly contemptuous of the bankruptcy process. It probably didn't help matters that in one of the photographs, 50 Cent was sat next to piles of cash, which had carefully arranged to spell the word broke. <laughs> Even if it's fake, my dude. Even if it's fake. Like she says, it's like laughing in the face of the bankruptcy process. Even if it's fake. And look, this person, this judge is like deciding what's going to happen to you. Don't be a dick about it. You should be being really nice to Anne. Perhaps he really was broke, though. After posting one particular photograph of several pink buckets of money over which he seemed to claim ownership, social media detectives are quick to highlight that it just swiped the image from an old news story about a traffic stop in Maine. In court, 50 Cent also claims that all of the other images featured fake prop money, too. All this was more likely an inadvisable taunting of the creditors that had left empty handed, including most notably Lestonia Levenston, and had ended up developing into a kind of reverse engineered fake flexing in which he was now insisting that the money wasn't real. Thankfully, 50 Cent did later emerge from bankruptcy and Lestonia Levinson received every cent of what she was due. Brilliant. Except for her dignity. Uh, he's probably not exactly financially flush these days, though. He now appears to spend a big chunk of his time on social media ranting and raving about people who owe him money. <laughs> My dude, stop. <laughs> Douche. Ah, yes. And now it's time for your boy to bring in a little money. My, my, my. Have you heard of Squarespace? Yeah, you have. Look, Squarespace is this place on the internet, did you know, where you can make a website. Maybe you're thinking, ooh, all of this talk of business on Business Blaze would make me want to start my own business. Or well, you can actually start your own shop on Business Blaze, which, oh, on Business Blaze, on Squarespace, which sort of blows my mind. I mean, do you remember back in the day when you wanted to make like a website? It was extremely complicated. You'd go in, there'd be like HTML, you'd be like typing shit, like that, that, that symbol that looks like this. I don't know what that's for, but they use it all the time in HTML. I, I, I know nothing about it. I mean, from like computer club at school. And it's like, okay, great, I've made the background turquoise. What's next? Now, you can build a shop in like, I, I would say five minutes, but that would be a lie. I think it took me an hour to put together, is that, maybe it's rottingturtle.co or rottingturtle.com, which is the website where you will soon be able to buy my new fragrance, Rotting Turtle. It smells like shit. I made it in Squarespace. It took an hour. It's actually insane. The best thing is you get a temp. I'm, I'm like not, I'm not someone to go into all the details and like fiddle around with everything. I just load up a template of a store that Squarespace is like, this is the t template and it's like a clothes shop or whatever. So I load that one. It looks great. I change some colors. I throw in my own images. I put in my own like text and price and all of this stuff. Uh, Will, who, the, who's the guy I do beard plays with, by the way, and he's also helping me do Rotting Turtle. He's like, I'm like, Will, can you jump in and set up like the payment thing? Because he handles all of that stuff because I'm shite at business. And he's like, yeah, 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 no problem. And I'm like, did you do it already? He's like, yeah, it was easy. And I'm like, you, of course it was, Will. And that's how Rotting Turtle is becoming a thing. Of course, Will also has to make the Rotting Turtle and he's been sending me scent samples and stuff. And by the way, fun fact, it's gonna be unisex because the sample that I loved the most was a unisex scent. It smells awesome. You guys are gonna love it. This is not an advert for Rotting Turtle. This is an advert for Squarespace. And I realize we've gone desperately off course. Uh, but you could, of course, if you've got your own idea for a big brain business, like my big brain business ideas, Merch, perfumes, and beard oil. Uh, <laughs> the finest things in life. Set up your own store on Squarespace. Or maybe you like some, I don't want to sell shit. 
I just want to write about my unpopular opinions and share them with the world. Well, do a blog with Squarespace. Do whatever you want with Squarespace. It's just the way to go. Also, my personal website is on Squarespace. And uh, it's got, like, links to what I do. You can contact me. I'm not going to read it. But, you know, all that great stuff. What else? The stuff I have to say. And we've gone wildly off topic. Oh, my lord. Squarespace has member areas. I don't have those, but I bet they're fantastic. Email campaigns. Yeah, you do need those. Collect donations. <laughs> Not a charity, Squarespace. But maybe you want to start a charity. Maybe you run a charity with Squarespace. Uh, social sharing, of course. Analytics. Yes, blogging tools. Dude, I feel like that was the first thing we mentioned. Go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze. You'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. I've done it like three times this ad read, but let's do it again. Mwah! Thank you, Squarespace, you legends. Let's get back to it. Lil Tay. Oh, was this the guy at the beginning? Did we hear about Lil Tay earlier? I feel like we did. No, we heard about Lil Kim. Is everyone Lil or something? I assume it means little. I also have no idea who this chap is. The Canadian YouTuber, internet personality, and occasional rapper called Lil Tay has clearly been taking a few lessons from Conor McGregor on how to prove that the Rolls Royce you're showing off really does belong to you. <laughs> Just fucking buy it. Just do it. Is rapping something like, I know uh, a lot of YouTubers get into rapping. Maybe that's my next move. Boom! I'd be so shit at rapping. I mean, look at me. In one YouTube video, she violently kicks. Oh, it's a girl. <laughs> she violently kicks a woman. Sorry, I don't know how old you are, Lil Tay. She violently kicks the size of a Rolls Royce until she puts a dent in it, then asks her audience in front uh, of millions, "If I rented my cars, do you think I'd be doing this?" No, Lil Tay. We think you're far more sensible than that. But there's one quite disturbing as aspect to the brief meteoric rise of Lil Tay back in 2018. She was only nine years old. Oh my god. And despite her youth, she appeared to have evolved into the queen of wealth flexing overnight. During that Rolls Royce video, she's seen as driving the vehicle a couple of feet before lurching to an unsteady halt and hopping out to deliver an angry diatribe to the camera. All your grown ass men hating on a nine year old. I ain't got no license, but I just dropped 40 racks on this car, bitch. As she bawled at the camera, the family dog Swaggy sat patiently in the passenger seat. He alone has over 800,000 followers on Instagram. Nine years old, that's insane. Uh, during the course of the wealth uh, of videos that she shared on social media, Lil Tay was regularly seen clutching piles of cash and occasionally even smoking hookah as she strolls around her lavish family home in Vancouver, delivering such pearls of wisdom as, I'm out here flexing on your broke-ass haters, and my toilet costs more money than your mama's rent. Wow, you seem just incredibly unlikable. The potty mouth rapper's dialogue was regularly peppered with quite a shocking selection of strong expletives, even though I'm not convinced. Wait, did we say she was smoking? Isn't she nine? What the fuck? That just registered with me. What is going on? Where are your parents? Who are you? Why does anyone care about you? Even though I'm not convinced she knew the meaning of behind what she was saying. Lil Tay may have racked up uh, over 2.1 million Instagram followers in the space in a few months by bragging about how incredibly rich she was, but things aren't quite as they seemed. Not by a very long way. Lil Tay's mom worked as a real estate agent for Pacific Evergreen Realty, but all those shots of luxury kitchens and expensive toilets were actually taken in properties that the company had on the market at the time. Whoops, a daisy? So that was a fucking lie. Who could ever find that out? I mean, other than by looking at the f***ing real estate listings. <laughs> you dumb dumb. Even the posh car belonged to the boss of the company who had kindly agreed to let Lil Tay pose with the car for a few nice photographs, completely unaware that she intended to kick the f*** out of it. If that was my Rolls Royce, and that happened, and she put the f***ing dog in the front seat, that, I mean, that is gonna get scratched up, and then she kicked the side of my car and be like, your mum's getting fired so hard. It's maximum dickhead move, but that was my Rolls Royce. After these revelations broke, Lil Tay's mum resigned from the company before she could be fired. And although Lil Tay may have come across as a bit of a spoiled, annoying brat in the videos, the nine-year-old star probably deserves deep sympathy rather than scorn. It's worth remembering, yeah, you can't really be responsible for this nine. I am way more like, where the f are your parents? And why the f aren't they doing a job of, you know, parenting? It's not that hard. I mean, it is hard. I'm a parent. It's not It's not super easy, but it's also not that difficult. It's worth remembering that you can't even open an Instagram account if you're under the age of 13, and the real brains behind the operation appeared to be her older half-brother, Jason. The guy had long harbored dreams of becoming a YouTube sensation without much success, but he now felt that his cute little sister could be the perfect vehicle to act as the face and voice of all the outrageous things that he wanted to say. Leaked video footage reveals how Jason was feeding scripts to Little Tay and guiding the clearly confused child on what exactly she should be doing with her trash talking and cash waving and car kicking. Oh, Jason! It's like we should be disappointed 
if I was your, if I were your parents, I'd be like, Jason, you fucking dick. I'm, s I, I'm so disappointed in the job I did and the person you turned out to be. Oh, that probably would be years in therapy for old Jaso right there. About two and a half months after her rise to fame, Little Tay disappeared completely from social media after her mother and estranged father came locked in a very public and very messy battle for custody and control over her future career path. It appears Little Tay had been a pawn in both a dysfunctional family and her brother's dream of building up a YouTube career, which never really got to the stage of generating any real revenue, oh boo-hoo. As one observer put it, the now homeschooled Little Tay's brief spell in the spotlight has left her too young to be rich and too famous to lead a normal life. It's been speculated by some that she'll be back very soon to launch the next phase of her career. In many ways, it might be healthier if she's allowed to have a childhood before she finally gets back in front of the camera under her own terms. Yes, there is a reason that Instagram are like, you gotta be 13. Bow wow. If there's one man who takes the crown for biggest and most prolific fake flexor of all time, it's got to be American rapper Bow Wow, who has been caught out telling more porkies than a drunken Enron accountant called Pinocchio. <laughs> Born Shad Gregory Moss. He's been rapping ever since the age of six, adopting the name Lil Bow Wow when he was discovered by Snoop Dogg at the age of 13, and simply by Bow Wow by the time he'd released his third, about third album at the ripe old age of 15. Holy s. He certainly made enough, mon enough money from a long and su successful career in music, acting, and most recently as a TV host personality. I feel like I've heard of this dude, but I've absolutely no idea about who he is, what he does, what he's been in, what his music sounds like. But he can't just seem to help himself when it comes to adding a few extra layers of bullshit. And it sounds as if everyone who knows him has their own quirky little story to tell. Fellow rapper Mayno recalls the time that they left a nightclub in New York City together and Bow Wow strolled up to a big, expensive black truck and explained that he just needed to wait for, it, wait for his personal chauffeur to turn up and take him home. There followed a few awkward moments as Bow Wow was clearly waiting for Mayno to leave the scene, but Mayno was in a chatty mood. Eventually, Bow Wow exclaimed, Yo, I'm out, and ran off down the street like a headless chicken to catch a cab. Dude, why? Aren't you, you're already rich. A big black truck? Are people impressed by that? It's a truck. Then there was the time in 2016 when Bow Wow posted a now deleted tweet in which he claimed it splashed out, splashed out on the VIP private suite to enjoy watching the Atlanta Falcons uh, play in that night's NFL game. But now he, but he sadly couldn't make it. The busy guy was just too damn exhausted from filming his new TV show all week, so he decided he was just going to hit the sack instead. He probably should have done just the tiniest bit of homework here. It was very swiftly pointed out that some of his three million by some of his three million followers that the Atlanta Falcons weren't even playing that week. Although was the time he posted a memorable picture with roots that dated back to the 90s, the original picture appeared on the iconic cover of Vibe magazine in 1996 under the headline Live from Death Row and featured some of the biggest heavyweight names from the massively influential hip-hop label Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Tupac, and Sir S Serge? Sug? Sug? Sug Knight? The tweet, I, I think it's Sug Knight, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of having a bit of a laugh there. I'm fairly sure it's Sug. Now I'm doubting myself, but I've heard of him. Oh my God, stop fucking lying. Uh, the tweet version of the cover that Bow Wow shared on Twitter added a few extra faces into the mix. Most notably, his own very young face had been clumsily sandwiched in between Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg under Bow Wow's new, quietly reflective caption of where it all started. Bow Wow would have been very young when this issue of Vibe originally went on sale, just six years old, in fact. He originally defended the Photoshop disaster by claiming that he was just retweeting a fan picture that was sent to him, although that doesn't explain the new egotistical caption. He might have got away with it if he hadn't left it at that, but then he started claiming that he had every right to be on the picture as he was signed to the Death Ray Records label at six years old anyway. While it's true that he started rapping at six, there's no evidence to suggest that he had even the remotest connection with Death Row or any of its stars before the age of about 13. My dude, that is seven years later. <laughs> My very, you see, it's a big age difference. It's more than double your age. My favorite story, though, is from 2017. He was about to fly out from Georgia to New York to begin press work on the new TV show, Growing Up in Hip Hop. He posted a picture on Instagram, which showed a luxury set of wheels parked on the tarmac in front of a private plane, alongside the caption, Travel Day, NYC press run for Growing Up Hip Hop. Let's go. I promise to bring you all the hottest shows ever. Literally, just a few hours later, another picture emerged on Snapchat, taken on the same day by a passenger on a commercial flight to New York. Ah, oh, that's so good. I love it. The eagle-eyed Snapchat user had spotted a fellow passenger with a familiar face staring into his phone while sitting in the cramped conditions of economy class. Ah, oh, dude. 
It later transpired that the rapper's image of a private plane had just been nicked from the Fort Lauderdale VIP transportation website, a company which was actually based hundreds of miles from where Bow Wow was meant to be taking off. Wait, he just photoshopped it? He didn't even go to the place? <laughs> Dude. He seemed to get a bit angry about this one, complaining that his critics should stay out of the big boy lane. That's the economy class big boy lane, obviously. All this fake flexing sparks a new social media craze called Bow Wow Challenge in which users shared outlandish extravagant pictures of their wealthy lifestyle before revealing the comedy punchline. So, for example, a picture taken on a supposed exotic holiday would la be later revealed to be a desktop screensaver, or a picture of the user's Land Rover going through a car wash, and it would later pan to reveal that it was just a toy car in the shower. But maybe Bow Wow was smarter than we think. In reaction to the merciless piss-taking of Bow Wow Challenge, he said, I love it, because people don't understand the scientific method to my madness. You gotta just watch the show. Everything's for the show. What are you talking about? <laughs> he seems to be implying that he's doing all of this on purpose to drum up publicity for his TV career, but I'm not sure if it's just an attempt to save face by claiming that he was actually kidding and the real joke is on everybody else. Yeah, it's like, no, 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 it's just joking. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. <laughs> That's it. That's definitely it. That's it. Or perhaps he really can genu generate genuine attention and respect from fake flexing. I wouldn't know about that kind of thing. Just excuse me, I gotta have another look at my complete collection of Simon Whistler decal stickers that cost me more than your mama's rent. Ah! This has been an episode of Business Plays brought to you by the legends over at Squarespace. Check them out, there is a link below. Thank you for watching.